once again, many thanks for this um, kind introduction and the kind invitation to um, show our work at this interesting um, workshop. Um, as already mentioned by Attila, um, uh, today's um, presentation will focus on um, the topic of mining, um, hydrological and clim climate data for detecting and attributing um, global change in the world's water cycle. Um, and as I realized that we um, are having here a quite diverse audience, I thought I first have a very short recap of the world's water cycle. Um, typically, um, uh, water cycles are depicted in diagrams like this, where we start in the oceans, where um, water is evaporated um, by energy provided by the sun, and then uh, goes to the atmosphere and is then transported um, in the atmosphere, um, either in clouds or as water vapor. And, also transported to the land where it finally can participate either in form of precipitation or, or a snowfall and subsequently hitting the land surface. And this diagram you see like in very detailed depictions of um, what might happen to the water once it has hit the land surface. So it might infiltrate into groundwater, might be stored in lakes, um, discharged by rivers and so on. There's a general problem with this type of depictions, and that is that they're um, very much biased. And which brings me to something that I would refer to as the bitter truth, um, uh, which is the distribution of water on Earth, where um, uh, the vast majority of all available water is stored in the oceans or as other saline water. And, uh, the water resources we are typically interested in as humans um, or from an ecosystem perspective, freshwater resources um, only make up a small fraction of the total available water. Of all freshwater, again, about two thirds are stored in the form of ice in the big ice caps, mostly like Antarctica or the North Pole. And finally, there's a very small fraction of freshwater um, stored as groundwater being available in other surface water or freshwater bodies. So the question is, if we are talking about in such insignificant quantity in terms of total water availability on the globe is, and why should we bother? And then, uh, there are several answers to this. One answer would be that we, of course, as humans and societies depend on these freshwater resources. But what we are also interested in is looking at um, uh, Earth system processes. So, and uh, terrestrial water can, for example, act as a catalyst of um, biogeochemical cycles that are, for instance, relevant for um, understanding ongoing climate change. So, in the remainder of this um, presentation, um, uh, I'll first have a very brief look in terrestrial water and biosphere processes. Um, based on this, we'll identify that some of the terrestrial water dynamics are relevant for climate change, but understanding climate change um, is today still impaired by a very fragmented observational record. And we'll investigate um, machine learning driven ways to overcome this fragmentation. Um, finally, we have a look at terrestrial freshwater and climate change, um, I try to follow up on the question whether things do change and try to understand what the drivers are. And uh, so we um, first focus on um, potential impacts of water availability on global biogeochemical cycles. And here we brought one example um, on drought and ecosystem production. So what we have here is the southern tip of Africa um, with the uh, um, markings of different vegetation types like crops, forests, and grassland. And in a recent study, um, we wanted to investigate to which degree um, 
drought um, do actually influence um, ecosystem productivity. So the amount of carbon that is absorbed by the ecosystem um, in form of photosynthesis. And uh, for this, we used a um, uh, remotely sensed indicator of photosynthetic activity and paired it with remotely sensed um, soil moisture observations um, uh, and produced these um, uh, drought response composites, what we call them. What you see here is on the y-axis, an anomaly in photosynthetic activity. And, uh, averaged over many drought events and on the X axis and um, the timeline around the drought event with zero being the height of the drought. And we see that there is a very clear response in ecosystem productivity or photosynthetic activity um, to the drought. There's also some distinction between vegetation types, but this is not the topic of today's presentation. Um, there a number of processes are um, relevant for understanding how ecosystems would respond to dryness or plants would respond to dryness. And there's, if we go to the current literature, two main mechanisms being discussed to be relevant on the ecosystem scale. Um, the first um, mechanism is the obvious one. So if there's less um, soil water available, or water available in the soil and the plants can take less water, can uptake less water, um, which at some point in time will impair their functioning. There's an, also a an second category of processes um, that might be relevant. And um, this is related to the CO2 uptake of plants. Um, uh, and as a matter of fact, plants need to open um, their stomata on the leaves um, for CO2 uptake. But while open, opening the stomata, um, uh, they are also um, uh, losing water. So they, they open, open basically their structure. And uh, if there is a high atmospheric water demand, which is um, controlled by the degree of um, water vapor saturation in the air, and um, the water may evaporate from the plant directly or transpired from the plant directly into the air. And there's also some significant evidence pointing towards that this might actually be dominating um, the drought response of ecosystems. Um, and it's currently debated in the literature. And uh, we recently had a look at this um, where, where we've again been investigating a uh, satellite-based indicator of um, photosynthetic activity, this time the so-called solar-induced chlorophyll fluorescence. And, uh, We've been investigating to which degree um, this would decline either through um, soil water supply, which we found to be dominating in most regions around the world, as highlighted here by the green tint on the map, um, and contrasted this to atmospheric water demand, which um, did play a much smaller role in many, many regions. Um, processes like this contribute to an overall um, global scale feedback, which we've been able to discover a couple of years ago, um, where we could show for the first time that um, the yearly CO2 growth rate, um, shown here on the y-axis, um, co-varies um, CO2 growth rate in the atmosphere. Um, so that's the average atmospheric CO2 concentration and uh, the degree of growth this has every year. Um, correlates highly with anomalies in total terrestrial water storage. So there's a total amount of water stored on land averaged over the entire globe. And uh, if we recognize these correlations, um, uh, we, we can of course also um, recognize that this might have um, implications for ongoing climate change, especially if we consider that climate change is controlled or driven by increasing CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. And if we um, consider that um, climate change is likely to affect terrestrial water resources. Um, just to illustrate this again, we have here on the um, left-hand side, an illustration of cumulative um, or of the relationship between cumulative anthropogenic CO2 emissions and expected temperature. Um, increase 
And uh, on the left hand side, we have an example for projected changes in water availability at the end of the century. And we see that um, in uh, several regions on the globe, um, we expect significant changes in water availability, which might have significant effects on the global carbon cycle through this planetary scale feedbacks. Um, so if this is projected for the future, there's of course the immediate follow-up question where if whether we can already detect such climate change impacts on fresh water dynamics at the global scale. And the um, first thing to do would be maybe to look at the state of the knowledge as summarized, um, uh, for example, by the last assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. But if we go to the relevant sections, we typically um, uh, find statements like confidence is low for an increasing trend in global river discharge. There's a lack of evidence regarding the sign of trends of floods at the global scale. And there's not enough evidence for a global scale observed trend in drought. And in conclusion, um, we have to say that the lack of observational evidence has prevented detection and attribution of anthropogenic climate change um, in terrestrial water resources. Um, so we thought it would be crucial to um, uh, overcome the fragmented observational record um, to tackle this and, and similar, similar research questions. Um, and uh, we've been um, working towards this task using several approaches. And the one I would like to illustrate you here is um, starts with uh, my smallest data collection or data set I have in, in my collection, which is this landmark, which was raised on the occasion of the largest flood um, recorded in, in the region, which is in the late 18th century. And that was a truly um, rare and extreme event, especially if we consider that the second largest but much smaller flood only occurred about 200 years later. What we are really interested in here is actually not um, this landmark, but in the small building in the background, which houses equipment for measuring um, river flow volume or water levels at the nearby river. Um, so the question we have is how do we get from like the sing kind of small single point observations in space um, to something that might have continental or global scale coverage? And uh, for this, we um, developed a quite simple regression approach where we start with station data from, um, and we focus station data of stream flow or river flow, and we focus on stations that have um, uh, catchments of the rivers that are relatively small that correspond in size approximately to 50 times 50 kilometer grid cell. Um, and we assume these to be um, independent and not to be connected to through river, river networks. And we say runoff at a spatial location S and in time step T is a function of um, uh, atmospheric um, forcing data, namely precipitation temperature. And we exploit that in atmospheric sciences, there's a long and very successful tradition um, for creating so-called gridded um, observational data set which are spatially continuous um, and data driven reconstructions um, of key atmospheric variables. And because we know that there is some, um, for example, some storage processes involved, um, it's necessary to integrate the information in time and we are uh, the, inter the information of precipitation temperature in time. And we do this um, or approximate this integration using time lag operators, where we say we, for example, don't only consider precipitation at this month now, but also at the previous month and the month before. And we go back um, uh, somewhere between six and 12 months in time. This, for example, allows us to approximate processes like snow dynamics, where precipitation falling as snow is first being stored and then only later released when the temperatures rise. And finally, we have this unknown function and we decided to approximate this using machine learners. Um, in the end, we 
did fall back on random forests, but principally other machine learners should, should also work well if they are set up rightly. So, so we can train these models at locations where we have observations. And since we have um, predictor variables that are continuous in space and time, we can also um, produce um, uh, predictions that are continuous in space and time. Here's an example from European case study. Um, uh, what you see here is um, anomalies of runoff. So this is um, data where the seasonal cycle has been removed and uh, where the reminder has been scaled to unit variants. Um, uh, to focus, for example, on uh, wet and dry events. And what you see here in the small black polygon is a catchment of the River Rhine um, uh, at engaging station at the um, border between uh, um, Germany and the Netherlands. And it is important to recall that um, uh, the data at this gauging station were never used for model calibration and the model was never calibrated to produce estimates at this relatively large spatial scale. But we can draw out um, the values and aggregate over, over the catchment. And we can compare the um, uh, simulated time series um, uh, to, to the observations um, here in, in red and blue, which would be the um, simulated time series. And what you cannot see now is actually already hidden in the background. Now you can see it. Um, the anomalies of the observation, which we are able to match um, relatively well, which gives us, alongside a large um, suite of other validation exercises, high confidence in the validity of the product. Um, this approach can then obviously not only be used for Europe, but we've been creating estimates of um, global or reconstructions of global freshwater dynamics ranging back to the early 20th century. Um, and we can use this to, for example, compute average statistics of the system like the um, long-term mean, or we can compute the average month with the minimum runoff or the average month with the maximum runoff, which for example, could be relevant for water resources management. We can also have a look at more dynamical features um, exemplified here in case of two significant drought events, one in Europe in summer of 1976, and one in the US in the 1930s, um, also referred to as the US Dust Bowl. And the first column of this um, plot um, shows um, again, standardized runoff anomalies, and we see um, that we are definitely in the dry range for both events. And the left um, column or the right column um, shows the rank of the anomaly. And we see that in both cases, these reportedly very extreme events um, are also ranked among the top five um, driest events in, in these regions over the entire um, uh, 20th century time frame. Um, Finally, I'd like to touch up on the question whether um, anthropogenic climate change is already influencing um, observed freshwater dynamics around the globe. And before we go into an example that is based on, on these reconstructions that I just showed, I wanted to start with um, a station, an analysis of the raw data. Um, we see here are trends in annual river flow um, at um, all stations that were available to us at a certain point in time. And uh, we express trends like in relative fashion and uh, in units of a percentage change. Um, and we see if we go at the station level on the left hand side that there's a large degree of natural variability around the trends, making it difficult to extract systematic patterns. But if we aggregate trend patterns over predefined regions, um, there are patterns that emerge around the globe, like in significant drying in the Mediterranean or in Northeast Brazil. Um, and the question is, um, what are the drivers? And, and uh, the immediate follow-up question would be, yeah, is it driven by changes in atmospheric boundary conditions like um, water input th through precipitation? And we can assess this by comparing observed trends 
to trends derived from independent reconstructions. These reconstructions are now built on physically based global hydrology models that are driven with um, uh, atmospheric reanalysis. And we can um, filter the um, uh, model output in such a way that it matches the observed record and we can compute equivalent trend patterns. And what you see here are two different flavors of these reconstructions. And uh, these correlate, the, the overall trend pattern, spatial trend pattern correlates generally quite well um, with the observations. And uh, being a strong evidence for that these observed trend patterns are driven by changes in atmospheric boundary conditions and not, for example, by changes in human water and land management. Um, leaving the question and um, whether these changes did occur just as a consequence of natural climate variability or whether there is maybe an uh, externally forced anthropogenic climate change signal. And for testing the um, uh, climate change hypothesis, we fall back on something called the detection and attribution approach, which I'll briefly introduce here with a European case study, um, where we have um, investigated trends in um, uh, European river flow, and where we see in the observations that there's a tendency of drying in the south and then tendency of wetting in the north. And this detection attribution strategy um, is built around the hypothesis that the observations are made up by a signal um, plus variability. And I go briefly through the individual terms here. So the observations are typically um, not station level observations, but aggregated in space and times um, to optimize signal to noise, noise ratio. The signal would be the expected response of the Earth system to an external forcing. Here, this would be, for example, increasing greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. And uh, this is usually estimated by averaging over many climate model runs. And finally, um, we have a term for natural variability. Um, and, uh, this is typically estimated on the basis of chaotic trajectories of climate models, um, a large ensemble of these, um, which are run using um, constant radiative forcing, which is held at pre-industrial levels. Um, and I'd like to think of these as a physically motivated null hypothesis. So we have like a climate model, which is um, complex nonlinear dynamical system, uh, which is used as a sampling machine to draw samples um, of um, variables we are interested in in the Earth system that hopefully resemble well in terms of their average properties, um, the true world. Um, inference is done by focusing on this beta, which is kind of a regression coefficient. And if beta is larger than one, we can say that the observations in signal are significantly correlated given natural estimates of natural variability. And uh, for this particular case, we can also show that, that we have um, significantly positive beta factors or scaling factors, um, yielding the conclusion that climate model capture the north-south gradient um, only if anthropogenic climate change is considered. Um, and we can now go back to um, the initial example where we, uh, where we had a look at trend patterns at the global scale, and we can observe, compare the observed trend against ESM-driven simulations um, that exclude effects of anthropogenic climate change, marked here as ACC, and uh, we can compare it also to um, uh, climate model driven simulations that account for the effects of anthropogenic climate change. And we can again compare um, these regression coefficients or scaling factors. And again, we can see that um, only climate model simulations that account for anthropogenic climate change are able to capture the observed trend patterns. Um, uh, again, yielding the conclusion that it's quite likely that um, effects of anthropogenic climate change are already detectable in the observed record of river flow across the world. 
Um, one limitation of this study here is, of course, that it's spatially very discontinuous. We are biased um, towards regions um, with high um, uh, sampling density, um, uh, which leaves a somewhat incomplete picture. So we decided to make use of um, reconstructions similar to the ones that I introduced before um, to look at um, uh, changes in dry season water availability being defined here as um, um, being defined here as um, uh, precipitation minus evaporation, but effectively we look at um, using water balance considerations as a sum of changes in terrestrial water storage plus, plus runoff. And uh, what you see here is um, the observed trend pattern with regions of wetting and drying. Um, and we see a um, quite high degree of spatial noise, both due to natural climate variability, as well as um, due, to, um, due to noise in the reconstruction. And we can contrast this um, to historical climate model simulations, which have a much smoother, but a little bit similar pattern. We can quantify the similarity um, uh, by simply correlating these maps. Um, uh, we get a correlation value, which is not particularly high, but, we, um, but it's still there, um, uh, and which is here denoted in this plot as a vertical line. So that's a correlation between the observations and the historical um, uh, simulations or the mean of the historical simulations. And to answer or, or try to um, see if this correlation is significant, we um, say we compare it to the hypothesis um, that the, or, or we have the null hypothesis that the observations do not contain any um, climate change signals. So they, would behave like natural climate variability. So we can compare this to the correlation between the historical simulations and um, uh, which is correlated to pre-industrial control simulations and which are samples of natural climate variability. And we see that on average, um, these correlations empirically derived um, are much smaller than the correlation between the historical simulations that account for um, greenhouse gas effects and the observations, again, yielding the conclusions that changes in dry season water availability um, are very likely affected um, by anthropogenic climate change. Um, there's also other detectable climate change impacts. Um, here's an example for lake ice duration um, where, um, where we see that the um, observed record in black um, uh, is very much followed by um, uh, historical climate model simulations that account for greenhouse gas emissions, while um, climate model simulations that don't account for these um, emissions shown in blue don't, don't capture the observed record. And a similar example um, is shown here for um, Per, trends in permafrost temperatures, where we have in red an observed trend in permafrost temperatures, um, the red histogram being um, simulations that account for greenhouse gas emissions, um, which capture this. But if we exclude greenhouse gas emissions, um, like we are not able to capture the observed trend. Um, leading me to my conclusions. So um, terrestrial freshwater is relevant. Um, for um, uh, it's a relevant component of the water cycle and it's a controlling factor of many earth system processes. Um, water cycle observations are unfortunately sparse in space and time, but data science methods can help to fill in some missing values. And there's mounting evidence that anthropogenic climate change is already affecting um, freshwater dynamics globally and um, with potential implications on planetary scale feedbacks. With this, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. So thank you, Lucas, for, for the great talk. Um,
Let us open this up for questions. So if you have a question, please write in the chat or unmute yourself. So, hi, Lucas, I'm Sabine. Hi, Sabine. Uh, good to see you again. Yeah, sure. uh, I, have, I have one question to, to, to the models you or the results you are showing, uh, the global ones, for example. Did you compare it with other uh, models? Uh, I mean, you, you mentioned the smaller, uh, the, the global models, but what happens with the, with the other models, the smaller scale models, for example? Yeah, so um, uh, catchment wise. Yeah, so so we have not compared it to to catchment mm. scale models. So this is uh, a studies that are focusing on producing mm. um, something that is useful for hopefully climate research. Mm. So we've been interested. Um, okay, in this European study, we've been interested in the European scale, um, and we did compare this against global scale. Um, global hydrological model simulations. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can briefly uh, maybe show one additional slide where we have um, uh, what you see here is like long term annual runoff. And, and we um, um, have now this global data product in, in the pipeline where we um, produce estimates with a large ensemble of different atmospheric crossing data which are and, and we did check the performance on larger river basins that were not used for for validation this is always monthly resolution mm -hmm. or daily resolution which we are currently not not doing mm -hmm. um, and uh, we have here we did several mm -hmm. tests here we look at the distribution of the correlation coefficient between the reconstruction and and the observations and and we get i would say reasonable correlations it's far from perfect and the best one would be the mean overall all of our reconstructions but if you compare it to global hydrology models and i'm aware that these differ like vastly in their setup and some being calibrated and some not and we see that on average we are able to extract the observed signal a little bit better mm. And, and and if you if you look at your machine learning or um, your your simpler models, so what are the factors you you really need to take into account in order to match the the runoff data? So you you yeah, mentioned so climate data. What do you need from the catchments or for the for, from the land surface itself? So do you have something like a DEM information yeah. or or soil so texture cool. or? Yeah. Great question. Um, so for the examples that I showed here. Um, we actually only used um, precipitation and temperature for um, for estimation, and that turned out to be sufficient to achieve the accuracy that we have. In uh, this European case study that I showed, I also tried to incorporate information on soil texture and, and uh, information on grid cell scale topography, like the average slope of the grid cells, and we did not find an uh, improvement in cross-validation experiments. So we decided to go for the more parsimonious model. Mm -hmm. um, of course, we also thought why this is the case, because like if we go out in the landscape and we see, of course, that water fluxes are also influenced by, for example, topography. And we think it has to do with the resolution of the data we are looking at. Mm. So we're looking at monthly time ah, steps, for okay. example, and uh, mm many processes like kinematic <laughs> wave propagation through channels and so on of course mm. uh, have a much smaller time scale and effects of these are likely to be averaged mm. out like we have currently a proposal in the pipeline to try to do mm. this at much higher resolution and mm. see see what I mean, happens the, we are curious yeah i mean you mentioned that or if in the hydrological model community it's 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 pretty clear that we need the topography and the soil texture information and thing or vegetation information like that but in the end you're saying something like so if we go to larger scales monthly or yearly scales is so much dominated by climate that the details on coarser scale at the land surface that do not matter so much that is at least what our analysis would okay. suggest mm -hmm. like um uh, and uh, of course, we have not um, tested all possible land surface mm -hmm. parameters excessively. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Are there any further questions? Yes, there's a question from uh, Ferina Maleska. Please go ahead. Yeah, hello. Um, thanks for the very interesting talk. I hope you can hear me. Um, yes. I have 
um, two questions. The first thing would be, which resolution did you um, account for in the global modeling? So the maps that you showed, what, what was the resolution about? Um, a half a degree, technically, okay. which corresponds to approximately 50 times 50 kilometer, depending on where you are on the globe. Yeah, okay, thanks. And uh, the second question um, relates to the machine learning approach you used. What do you think when you are transferring this to a more uh, finer resolution? Um, do you think the same approaches will work or do you think, um, I don't know what you used for machine learning, um, do you think the approach is more complex? Um, yeah, it's a great question. So there's maybe two layers to this answer. So if, I think a naive copy of the approach that I used um, like will, would fail um, because of memory requirement. So you might remember that I had to embed um, uh, the time series of the atmospheric forcing into time lagged matrices, um, mm -hmm. which then kind of means that there's like a multiplication of the, the mem memory. So if you times 12, for example, if you have monthly resolution, we go back a year. If you have, would have daily resolution, would do the same. Um, uh, that would be times 365. Um, which then can can make memory requirements difficult. But there are um, some studies now emerging over the last couple, two, three, four, five years, where people have been using, for example, LSTMs um, to model daily resolution stream flow, also with like also across across different spatial locations. So where you would be able to predict a new location. Um, once you have trained on a couple of other locations. And this work is actually pretty promising. And, and we are also following up on this, observing this like with a great interest. Right, thanks. Maybe a follow-up question on, on this machine learning model you had where you predicted lack and abundance of, of fresh water. I'm curious, did you also, besides the different types of machine learning methods. Did you also, did, did you analyze how much data you had to provide to achieve a certain accuracy? And could you kind of find the minimal amount of data you needed for that accuracy, which would be useful for transferring this to other models? Um, no, we did not do this. And this is a very great point. I can, can speculate a little bit. Um, I think effectively we have less because the data are highly correlated in space and time. We have effectively less, a smaller number of degrees of freedom or less, less data available than we have, have now. And, and we did some uh, kind of target oriented cross validation experiments where we um, did not remove data at random, but we removed, for example, entire subcontinents. And of course, we see then that um, the performance of the of the model drops if we um, remove like spatially very correlated regions. But it does not drop like endlessly. So, um, which may could be an indication for that we might be able to do well with less data, um, especially if the data we we keep enough. So, so if we imagine we, we sample from like a trajectory space and the important thing I guess is not to have much data but to hopefully sample the trajectory space relatively evenly to, to hopefully have at least a few examples of things that are physically possible. If there isn't any other question, then uh, I'd like to thank Lucas again. Thank you very much for being here. I'd like to thank the audience for the questions and the discussion. Um, um, this is the, the final talk of, of today's workshop. We will continue tomorrow at 4.15 p.m. Um, it's just being shown on the screen with a talk by Margaret uh, uh, Bogdan on statistical methods for reduction of dimensional fat data sets. Um, Thanks again, Lucas, and I wish everyone a nice evening.